I'm Nick Zeppos, Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Welcome to the Zeppos Report, a podcast where I talk with the people shaping and helping us understand our world. Today, I'd have to say our world, our galaxy, our universe, and perhaps the multiverses that, that, that people are, are speculating about. So my guest today is Kayvon Stassen, Stevenson Professor of Physics and Astronomy here at Vanderbilt. Kayvon has worked here since 2003. Kayvon, you've been here since 2003. That means that I signed your appointment, your tenure, your promotion, and your Stevenson chair. That's right. So I've been riding, <laughs> I've been riding in the sidecar for 14 years. I've gotten to know your signature well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he has crafted an expansive research portfolio with over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles, he has also mentored countless aspiring scholars from a diversity of backgrounds as the co-director of the Fisk Vanderbilt Masters to PhD Bridge Program. Kayvon has joined me today to bring us further insight into the fascinating field of astronomy as we prepare for a rather remarkable celestial event that we will witness on campus here in Nashville, the total solar eclipse taking place on August 21st. Kayvon, it's great to have you here today. Always a pleasure, Chancellor. Thank you so much. So uh, you've said that uh, some of the most important phenomena in astronomy occur on astronomical timescales. Mm. Yet astronomers are generally limited to much shorter human timescales. Could you talk about the excitement that happens when those timescales actually align? Yeah. It is. It's a. It's a. A lovely way of phrasing the question, and it is, I think, um, p p part of what makes uh, something like a solar eclipse such a, a singularly exciting experience for an astronomer as for everybody, is that as you said, you know, the vast majority of the work that I do. Feels like taking but one snapshot in a very long, slow, <laughs> you know, process. And uh, the, the, the opportunities that we have as astronomers to actually see something of import in the universe play out in real time, as it were, um, you know, they're, they're few and far between. Yes, I think, um, you know, it's, it's just with admiration and fascination to see someone work in a field where they have to be unflinching about, you know, a, a universe that's 14 billion years old. And I was listening to something the other day and someone was saying, well, you know, we're kind of young in the universe now. Why did we come along so young? And mm -hmm. well, maybe there was a multiverse. And, yeah. and I'm like, God, 14 mm -hmm. billion years. I mean, we, <laughs> um, how did you become interested in astronomy i mean when you because yeah. we all gaze up to the sky as little kids or yeah. we ask our parents or siblings what is that and since time i think probably since not just humans but all creatures who might even mm. navigate in celestial ways that we're finding out or the magnetic poles we're all drawn to the stars in the skies what was yeah. your draw cave on yeah I have to tell you honestly, you know, I grew up, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. There was there, <laughs> there were no stars to yeah, see, yeah. Uh, well, that, 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 not of this yeah. kind anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so so to be perfectly honest with you, I mean, sure, I looked up at the sky from from, from time to time, but the the skies over Los Angeles are not inspiring in uh, in, in this kind of way. Uh, you know, for me, the beginnings was a combination of. Uh, a sense that I wanted to be involved in something grand and important. Um, and so I came to learn that astronomers ask some of the grandest questions that can be asked. Um, as, a, as, a, as a child, I also got a lot of feedback from teachers about my abilities with math and science. And so ultimately, that desire to be involved in grand questions and a proclivity for math and science sort of t took me toward the path of astronomy. But I will say, and this is relevant now to my work as a professor here at Vanderbilt, I had a, uh, 
a kind of an existential crisis my freshman year at Berkeley. I was taking. That's why you go to Berkeley. That's to why you go to have an existential crisis. I wasn't <laughs> or expecting. College, yeah. That's right. I wasn't expecting this one though. I, I was in my introductory physics sequence, hmm. and and it hit me that as much as I had been told to that point that I was good at science, the fact is I had never actually done science. And so it wasn't until in, at the end of my freshman year that one of the professors invited me to become involved in research in his group that summer wow. that I actually became directly involved in the experience of scientific inquiry and discovery. And so that has stayed with me. And so I, I constantly now seek out those, those young freshmen who are taking my introductory astronomy class to say, you're interested in this subject. You haven't actually done it. Mm -hmm. Come and join my group and experience what research is all about. Well, I think that's, uh, you know, certainly for me, and I think obviously for you, that's the whole point of going to a Vanderbilt, that there are great teachers who can excite people in the classroom and stimulate discussion, but the magic comes from you are going to discover new knowledge with me. You're not. You're going to be a right. doer of it, right. not a watcher of yeah, it. Yeah. And I think that's that's just phenomenal to to really start with with freshmen. Um, so how have you been kind of dealing with the onrush of <laughs> global interest in this eclipse, particularly given the path right. that it is taking through? our backyard yeah. how have you prepared yeah. how have you thought about this yeah. as uh, somebody who lives this every day yeah yeah well you know the experience of a total solar eclipse is something that nobody lives every day yeah right uh I'll, i will tell you i have not this will be my first total solar eclipse i have seen many partial solar eclipses mm -hmm. and i have seen pictures of total solar eclipses and i've read about them um, but the opportunity that any individual will have at the given spot where they live to experience a total solar eclipse, I mean, it truly is a once-in-a-lifetime thing, if that. Uh, so I'm as, I'm as giddy about it as anybody else. Being in Nashville feels like a, a real special privilege on top of it all. Right. Uh, because, you know, this is a city that tends to really come together around things. Right. Right? I mean, just look at what happened with the Predators. Right, and the I was going to say, we may, have, <laughs> we may have to shut lower Broadway to watch the eclipse. That's it's, right. There might be a plan for that. That's right. Well, yeah. I'm going to be on the roof of the Acme Feed and Seed yep. Uh, yep, hosting a party. What are uh, your plans for that? Well, Day. I will be there uh, with, my, uh, with my fellow hipsters, uh, <laughs> gazing skyward and hopefully uh, spewing some, some fun facts about, about eclipses. Yep. But, you know, what I'm most excited about is, you know, as astronomical and technical and, you know, there are cycles within cycles and some of the sort of the mathematics of, of solar eclipses, you know, can be, you know, sort of technical and complicated. At the moment of totality, and it really is a moment, it'll last not even two minutes in downtown Nashville. Um, at the moment of totality, it becomes a singularly human experience and one where the people that you're standing with and experiencing with, I mean, it is spiritual. And um, I think that's just such a, such a great metaphor for astronomy, generally speaking. It is something that we pursue as a technical human endeavor, but those moments of discovery uh, uh, and and observation really ultimately are just so very human. Yes, it's uh, certainly going back to ancient times. We can explain it now as a very simple rotation of yeah. spheres in space and yeah. mathematically predict them and yeah. say, well, the shadow's going over the sun or mm -hmm. on a lunar eclipse, yeah. you know, the other way, whatever. But yet there is this kind of spiritual moment um do you think that's really because of the feel that people you know if, if i want to know who my relatives are or my ancestors are hmm. or i want to know the history of something that there's something in us that we just keep pushing back and say well 
I want to know how did we get here and why is that doing that? And do you think astronomy and astrophysics is in many ways a scientific endeavor that reaches down into the spirit and the soul? Well, you know, I have to tell you, that's always been my personal experience uh, with the field. Um, you know, to be clear, 99.9% .9 of the time when I'm doing astronomy, I mean, I'm having a great time, yeah. um, but it's not particularly spiritual. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In fact, some yeah. of it is quite dull. Yeah. Uh, but there are those moments, those punctuated, indescribable moments of, uh, I think spiritual really is the word, where you feel like you make contact with uh, some, you know, even if it's just, you know, making contact with a deeper understanding and the knowledge that that deeper understanding is not only being lived within you individually in that moment, but through the process of science gets to be lived out and understood forevermore. That's an incredible thing. Yeah. What, uh, you know, I know that uh, over the centuries, eclipses have been you know, understood and then studied. And, mm. you know, I, I seem to recall that Einstein's theory of general relativity and mm -hmm. the curvature of space was, you know, proven by mm -hmm. an eclipse. And I knew that before the TV series went on. <laughs> I want everyone to know that. Mm -hmm. um, how does this eclipse fit into the research that you do and mm. how is it in a fundamental way important to your work and the work of others in your field, Kayvon? Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I think you're right to rem remind everyone of the, the, the role that solar eclipses played in r really pr proving um, g general relativity. It was, you know, in that rare opportunity to observe starlight passing right close to the edge of the sun that on a sunny day you just would never be able to see it, um, that allowed one of Einstein's key theories uh, to be tested. Today, part of what makes solar eclipses still so singularly valuable for astrophysical research is so it turns out, so I'm a stellar astrophysicist. I spend my career studying stars like the sun and increasingly the planets that we now know orbit them. Uh, but it turns out stars are big magnets. And just as the Earth has a magnetic field that allows our compasses to point north, uh, the sun has a magnetic field with a north pole and a south pole. Mm. Um, as far as stars go, actually, our own sun has a rel is a relatively weak magnet because our sun is relatively old. When stars like the sun are younger, when planets are first forming around them, the st the, those stars' magnetic fields are, can be very, very strong. And the magnetism of stars is, broadly speaking, one of the areas of astrophysics that is just least understood because the way in which a star becomes magnetized and remains magnetized uh, is, is, it has to do with the inner workings of the star, motions within the star, currents within the star that we cannot directly observe from the outside. Hmm. Uh, and so it is an active area of research, um, uh, lots of questions. Coming back to a total solar eclipse, because of the incredible coincidence of our moon blocking out the disk of the sun exactly, we can in that moment study the, the emanations of the sun's magnetism right above the sun's surface in a way that we just can't do at any other time. Hmm. Uh, and so... How fascinating. That, that's part of the, the stellar astrophysics that I'm excited about uh, w w when it comes to a solar eclipse. Uh, you and your colleagues recently made a, a big discovery of the longest stellar eclipse mm. known to yeah. humans. and um, We made the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> <laughs> One of many. Could you kind of share what led to the discovery? And was it like crunching data and then an aha moment? Or tell us about that discovery and why it's so exciting and important. Yeah. So, um, uh, aside from August 21st, 2017, 
uh, most of the kinds of eclipses that I spend my time looking for and studying are the teeny tiny eclipses that occur when a little earth passes directly in front of a distant sun as that earth orbits that sun um, if as seen by us that little earth passes directly in front of its sun it creates a teeny tiny little eclipse that we can measure it's amazing to me that we can measure it but we do and this is how we find these other worlds um, in the year 2008, roughly, my research group deployed to South Africa a small telescope uh, that we have been operating robotically ever since um, to, to measure the brightnesses of hundreds of thousands of stars every night to look for these teeny tiny eclipses that tell us that there's a planet orbiting that star. And we have now found many planets in that process, some of them really quite exciting. But along the way, because we're studying hundreds of thousands of stars, most of which don't do anything particularly interesting, every now and then we'll find something that really is a head-scratcher. Um, and in this case, my graduate student, uh, Joey Rodriguez, uh, who came to my group through the Fisk Vanderbilt Fisk program, program that you mentioned, um, was processing the, the data and noticed that one of the stars that we were studying from South Africa um, suddenly became dimmer, but not in this teeny tiny way that tells us that there's a planet going in front, but it got a lot dimmer. And then it got even dimmer than that. And then finally, it totally blanked out. It like disappeared from our images. Obviously, the star hadn't disappeared. It just became so faint that we could no longer see it. The star became so faint that we could no longer see it. And we thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, well, let's see what happens. Surely it'll reemerge mm -hmm. any day now. Well, a year went by, a year and a half, two years. Finally, after about two years, Joey says, that star, remember that star that disappeared? It's starting to reemerge. Well, and it finally completely reemerged, came back to normal. It had winked out for two years. So we went back, and Joey found some archival measurements of that region of the sky uh, from the South African Astronomical Observatory going back to the early 1900s. And studying those archival photographic plates, they were glass mm -hmm. plates with uh, photographic emulsion on them. Um, Joey was able to measure the brightness of that star going back over a century wow. and found that the star had winked out just like that for a period of two years, 70 years before. Mm. And so little by little, we pieced it together. Every 69 years, it turns out, this star winks out for a couple of years. And through some additional analysis and measure measurements in the infrared and other kinds of things, we pieced it together. There is another star orbiting this star. The star that's orbiting the main star itself has a big disk of gas and dust around it, out of which planets form. And that disk of gas and dust is oriented just so that when it passes in front of the main star, it completely screens it. Hmm. And it takes a couple of years for it to pass by. And then 70 years later, it swings back around. <laughs> it's the longest known eclipse of a star ever recorded. <laughs> but it also you know, brings up another uh, fascinating area that uh, you work on, and uh, we see it more and more as our discoveries continue, which is, oh, there is another star with, quote, Earth-like, unquote, systems around mm. it. So what makes, is there something scientifically distinctive about our solar system that you can then go and use hmm. your expertise and technology to say this is similar. And what is that unique quality and how do you find those other potential solar systems? Yeah. So, you know, I would say one of the most surprising and exciting results of exoplanet science of the past decade or two is the discovery that 
um, not only is there an abundance of other worlds out there, but there's an incredible diversity of other worlds and other planetary systems. Um, so, you know, one of the earliest discoveries that really surprised people was that the very first other planets that were found outside of our solar system were planets like our Jupiter, but orbiting closer to their suns than our own Mercury orbits our sun. Mm. We call these hot Jupiters. Nobody imagined that such planets existed. Are they gas giants they that close? They are gas giants that close, huh. right. Um, and so we still don't really know how they get there. Yeah. Um, but there's a whole population of these hot Jupiters out there. We find them all the time. Um, we also have found solar systems that have planets that we now call super-Earths, which our own solar system does not have an exemplar of. These are planets that are like Earth or Mars in terms of their rocky composition. They're smallish, rocky bodies, but they're sort of halfway in size between the Earth Marses and the Jupiter Saturns. Mm. So they're basically very big, rocky planets, super Earths. Our solar system doesn't have one. Maybe at one point we did. Remember, there's an asteroid belt of rocky oh. debris between uh, Mars and Jupiter. Um, but in any case, we've discovered that there are these super Earths out there, so that's interesting. From the standpoint of looking for a true Earth analog, an Earth 2.0, if you will, um, there are different ways of, of, of defining that, but a, but a standard way of doing that is to talk about the habitable zone. Mm -hmm. So right as far as life as we know it is concerned, you know, liquid water, uh, temperate uh, uh, atmosphere, those seem to be pretty important ingredients. So you can ask, does a star have a rocky planet? And does that rocky planet orbit at the right distance from its star such that its surface is likely to be the right temperature, that if it has an atmosphere like ours, then it is likely to have water in liquid form, right? So that really sets a very stringent mm -hmm. uh, requirement right. on not only the existence of a planet, but where it has to be in relation to its star. Um, and we have so far found relatively few such examples of that. Um, so from the standpoint of the requirements of life as we know it, seem to be pretty stringent requirements. It doesn't seem that we are totally unique, but it, uh, but it looks like it's probably a rel relatively rare configuration. And do your friends in biology keep you in line <laughs> where you kind of say, okay, could something, there's a lot of methane, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, uh, chlorine gas, yeah. could something live here? I mean, so that's pretty much defined in a rigorous way, astronomically and biologically. Well, I mean, I would say that, you know, there is only one biochemistry that we know of. Right. That, that works. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I remember growing up watching the, the original Star Trek series. Mm -hmm. and there was this one great episode where they contemplating, contemplated a, a silicon-based biochemistry as opposed to a carbon-based one like we are. We might be getting there with some of the artificial intelligence things that you yeah, know, oh, right. talking That's about. right. <laughs> um, so that's fun to think about is are there entirely different ways that life can play out? What I find to be a, a, a really interesting question from the standpoint of astrobiology, well, interesting on the one hand but also frustrating, is to ask, you know, one question is, is a planet that you discover potentially habitable? Mm. That's one thing. And we can sort of answer that question. Another question is, is it inhabited? Right. And, you know, we're not going to travel to these planets anytime right. soon. Right. So it all becomes a remote sensing question. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you were looking at our Earth from a thousand light years away, would you know, even if you knew that the Earth was habitable, would you know that it was inhabited? Right. You wouldn't be able to see the Las Vegas Strip, maybe, right. from that no, far away, no. or the Hollywood no. sign. Or, you, might detect, yeah. you might detect ozone in our right. atmosphere, carbon dioxide, but would that necessarily tell you that there were people down there breathing it and cows down there, you know, flatulating and yeah. stuff? I, you know, I, that's a very, very hard proposition. Yeah. <laughs> 
You know, one thing that uh, I think you demonstrate, and certainly as I've been privileged to be on a journey with you, is how global your scholarly mm. community is. Mm. And that Vanderbilt is a global university, and we're only as strong as our ability to bring that rich global diversity. And, you know, you talk about, well, you know, we have a remote uh, uh, telescope in South Africa. I remember uh, working with you, I think, to get some time in Chile yeah. for uh, your important work with your yeah. students yeah. and certainly um, Australia, mm -hmm. I know, has been important. Talk about that global community of astronomy and how important it is for ideas and discovery. Yeah. You know, in a, in a sense, astronomy can really only be done as a, as a whole earth, <laughs> uh, you know, all hands on deck kind of endeavor. Um, uh, you know, the, the earth, you know, for those of us who are, you know, who are, who are, you know, mere mortals and are, and are bound uh, to, to the earth, you know, it, it is an incredibly frustrating thing that the earth spins around every 24 hours because, <laughs> because there you are on a mountaintop in the Chilean yeah. Andes and, uh, you know, that star that you desperately want to point your telescope at, you know, you only have a few hours <laughs> before, darn it, the earth has swung around again yeah. and you have to, you know, go to sleep and wait till the next day and then maybe it's cloudy. And, um, and so, you know, astronomers had to learn right very early on that if, if we were going to undertake some of the most important research questions that we want to undertake, we're going to need our colleagues in Australia and South Africa and Chile and, and, and Europe and everywhere so that we can, at any given time, look out in all directions, even as we stand here on this spaceship that's hurtling through space and spinning at a th you know, thousand miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so if only for that very practical reason, it has had to be a global endeavor. Um, but I think the more that we learn about the power of human diversity, I think there's an even more important reason um, that we have that astronomy has benefited from all along, but I think that we now understand better. And that is that um, different minds come together. Um, each of those individual minds becomes better and stronger and smarter. <laughs> and we can tackle and solve problems more efficiently and more honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that is an advantage that astronomy has had as a field, even if we haven't always known exactly why that benefit of operating globally and in such a diverse way um, has enabled so many discoveries. I wonder, too, if it's, you know, there's just this rich diversity of perspectives and vantage points and culture mm -hmm. that adds so much to, you know, even in my field of law, you say, you know, I never saw it that way. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it that way. Right. Uh, you know, I, I didn't see that relationship to that. But then, you know, you are kind of all joined together by okay, we have this rich diversity, but we are inhabiting this globe as humans in this universe. Mm -hmm. And so I think common cause to really push the question of astronomy and genealogy through this rich diversity of perspectives yeah. really makes you and your field kind of the, you know, in many ways an exemplar for literature, mm. history, biology, languages, sociology, economics, you know, almost everything that one can, can think about. Mm -hmm. um, medicine, yeah. um, you know, it's, you know, we, we kind of say, well, this is the paradigm. Mm -hmm. But yet you go into other countries and they're like, well, this is, yeah, we kind of get that, but there's also this, paradigm or this vantage point yeah. that has been part of our lives for thousands of years and so yeah i think it's it's really important and 
You know, I, I, another, uh, I think, thing I, I, I and so many deeply admire you for is, you know, you have, you know, and it might just be part of your journey, said, you know, there are a lot of young people from different backgrounds and different ethnicities and races who really would love astronomy, would love physics, and we're missing them. Mm -hmm. And that's not right. Yeah. And so you, I mean, for all of your other articles in top mm -hmm. journals, mm -hmm. teaching awards, yeah. grants, yeah. I saw you just got another award. Yeah. You've really devoted yourself in a way that addresses this question of the pipeline. Mm. And I, in many ways, think, you know, that might be for a young person, which you are, one of your greatest legacies, mm. Kayvon. And mm. how did you, you know, raising a family mm. and having a career, and you said, well, I've got to give back to change the face and composition to do great science. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I you know, it's, you know, uh, I have to be honest with you. I mean, I think uh, the honest answer is a certain amount of selfish, uh, <laughs> uh, selfishness on my part. You know, uh, starting as a as a assistant professor, you know, I had to build up my lab, and uh, I wanted to bring in, uh, you know, rapidly bring in some you know f fresh talent into my lab, graduate students and postdocs recruit some undergraduates, you know, really build up the lab quickly and get some work done. And so I thought, well, you know, if I build a pipeline, um, I can be assured, if nothing else, that I'm going to have a steady flow of <laughs> fantastic young people working in my lab at all times. And that has really played out <laughs> yeah. splendidly, you know. Uh, at any given time, right now, I have uh, eight or nine PhD students in my lab. I have four postdoctoral scientists. A uh, number of Vanderbilt undergraduates working with me, summer interns, and um, so you know I'm stoking my lab constantly with this <laughs> pipeline. So that's that's one that's one way in which it was selfish. Another way in which it was selfish, honestly, is um, I really believe that you know we all want to lead meaningful lives, and um, it is a it is a struggle, right, um, to find one's avocation that represents that thing that is larger than oneself to which one can really devote oneself. And I was, I was able to find that thing, and um, that, um, that has been extremely rewarding. Um, so that's my, that's my selfish answer. Um, there's also definitely a legacy aspect of it from the standpoint that, um, you know, growing up and... Uh, you know, being raised by a you know by a, a single mother who was a Mexican immigrant. You know, there was there's always been this narrative in my life of uh, paying it forward. Mm. Um, of you know, you know, my mom would say, you know, I get you to the, I get you to the base camp. Basically, your job is to get to the summit. And so I view, I have that same view now of my students. Um, I get them to base camps, at, they get to yeah, summit. And she looks at you like uh, as a wonder of the universe, <laughs> right? As her shining star. Yeah. She is very proud of me. She but should I, you know, be. I, I I'm also, proud of you, and I'm only the chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think about her incredible journey. Yeah. And um, what, a, what, a, what, a, what an incredible example it is of... Um, you know, we, we throw around the phrase American dream. You know, she, she really lived it. Yeah. Um, she came to this country um, focused on that American dream of achieving it, of, of, of identifying as a new American yeah. and wanting to partake in the American experiment, yeah. right? And I think, um, my goodness, in or, you know, if we're going to continue making discoveries, if we're going to maintain global leadership in science and technology, if we're going to remain a beacon of democracy, uh, we've got to continue to attract and welcome folks who want nothing more than to be Americans. <laughs> yeah. um, I seem to uh, recall a statistic that you're graduating 50, 60, 70 percent of underrepresented 
PhDs in physics and astrophysics mm -hmm. in our country. Yeah, that's right. And are you starting, and I've seen some of the amazing work and placements, are you starting to kind of crack that glass ceiling or that, you know, brick wall in your field where people are saying, yeah, this is, this is really working and we're hiring and we're changing. Yeah. Um, do you feel like it, it never goes quickly enough, but do you feel like you're seeing people welcoming and more curious about your own work with mm -hmm. these students, Kayvon? Yeah, I mean, I think that has been a great, um, I consider it a great privilege, uh, has been to see this work uh, not only have impact here at Vanderbilt and in my lab, um, but but now other institutions are asking, how can we do that? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I'll tell you, when I first came to Vanderbilt, you, you know, Vanderbilt was not considered um, an astrophysical, you know, a powerhouse in astrophysics. Uh, we have relatively small research group and and I remember when I first came to Vanderbilt, there were colleagues who said, you know, why did you go to Vanderbilt? You know, what, what, what is there for you? And I would talk about the incredible opportunity that I saw to build something unlike anything that anybody, any of our peers had done yet. And that was to build this kind of a pipeline and at the same time advance discovery. And, and now it, it brings me enormous pleasure <laughs> yeah. uh, to have call the, some of those same colleagues saying, how can we do what Vanderbilt is doing? Yeah. I think you're right about that. I've always thought that, you know, we have to try to empower our faculty to do things differently yeah. and to recruit and retain the very best. We've got to say, you can do something here that you can't do elsewhere. And I can certainly tell our audience that, I mean, you get recruited all the time <laughs> away from Vanderbilt. And I, I, um, I think one of the things that I appreciate about you is that you said, I can do something here I probably can't do elsewhere. And then you set an example for others as we recruit. Mm. And if I'm bringing somebody in, yeah in political science and evolutionary biology, mm -hmm. you're going to build this new program. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I mean, um, yeah, yeah. and it's like, we'll talk to Kava <laughs> and, yeah. and, and kind of see what, it, what, is, what he's up to next. Do you still feel like when you look out in that audience that part of your job is, you know, of course, to be rigorous, but yet to say, you know what, don't count yourself out, I think, you really are talented. Yeah. And I think that um, for professors, that sort of validation of a young person is sometimes the most important validation mm -hmm. they'll ever get in life. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And, you know, coming back to something I mentioned earlier, I think one of the ways that we can, I I here at Vanderbilt and everywhere else, do a better job of providing that kind of validation is to catch those incoming students as freshmen and say, let me tell you something, you know, I know you're interested in this subject. You haven't actually experienced it yet. <laughs> let me give you that experience. And that's something that I think places like Vanderbilt, um, you know, that, that, that that's the kind of experience we can give our students uh, that, that not every, not, not every place can, can give. So uh, let me finish up with uh, just some speculations about what you're working on and you know, what are the next big discoveries in your field? I mean, mm -hmm. I know we talk about dark matter, mm -hmm. dark energy. Um, what are the big areas you're looking at? And where do you think our eyes will again be stretched wide open again as advances come in your field? Yeah. Well, I, I you know, maybe only because I, I'm working in this area, but truly, I, I think in terms of the relatively short term, uh, you know, my research group is involved in an upcoming NASA mission called TESS, the Transiting Extrasolar Survey Satellite. Um, and we're going to be finding Earth-like worlds around other suns. Wow. 
um, by the dozens, and that mission is going to launch in early 2018. I can pretty much promise you and everybody who's listening that by 2019, 2020, we will know not only that there exist other Earths like ours, but we'll be able to go outside in our backyard, and if it's suitably dark, point up at a particular star Mm. and say, that one right there has an Earth just like the one that I'm standing on. And I think that will represent uh, a milestone in human achievement and understanding. With all of the advances in, uh, uh, in searching for other worlds that we've had, you know, we're still, we're, we're still just on the cusp of getting to that point where we can almost personalize it. And it's not just in concept, yes, I can imagine the Earth going around this other sun, but step out point to a star and say that one (laughs) i think it also deals with your um insights about time scale yeah that if you start out by saying you know see that up there that is two zillion light years away (laughs) and that star still may not be there and there might be you know to, to be able to say you know and i think this is maybe why the space program was so important for America to inspire a generation of young people Mm. and to say, you know, this is what we can discover. We can tell you Mm -hmm. that up there, you can see that right around there, there's an, there's an earth. Um, What do you make um, from a kind of human scientific standpoint of this thirst to travel to Mars and, you know, or, you know, kind of go to the moon and start mining the moon or what do you make of this um, human thirst for discovery and, you know, kind of ownership of, you know, physical space? Yeah. Um, So let me answer it by telling you a quick story about my my son. My 11-year-old son, Jamie, just started middle school yesterday. Uh, And Jamie's on the autism spectrum. And uh, as you may know, you know, autistic uh, kids tend to be very concrete, literal thinkers. And when he was about five or six and I was explaining to him about the sun and stars and the life cycles of stars, and I told him that our our solar system is four and a half billion years old, and that in about another five billion years, our sun will swell up, it will become a red giant star, it'll swallow up the Earth and Mars, and then it'll die. And he got this very concerned look on his face, and I said, but, but look, five billion years, don't yeah. worry about it. He's been worrying about it. Yeah. And in yeah. his mind, uh, he, he aspires to become a civil engineer, and he will. Hmm. In his mind, we've got five billion years to figure out how to transport humanity and all of our knowledge, uh, we, we've got five billion years yeah. to figure out this engineering challenge of how we're going to get to some other wow. Earth very far away. Wow. And so for him, it is not this sort of abstract, sort of big time scale, don't worry about it thing. It is a real engineering problem. Yeah. And I find something so incredibly hopeful <laughs> yeah. about that view, um, that five billion years from now, not only will we still be here, but that there will be something worth preserving. Yeah. <laughs> that we might as well get started now yeah. and start chipping away at that problem. It may take us five billion years to figure it out, but we'll, darn it, we'll get there. <laughs> well, uh, Kayvon, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the Zeppos Report. Um, you've been a leader in so many different fields, and you're such a great citizen of our Vanderbilt community, I feel confident that Jamie's task is going to be made a lot easier easier because you're there with him and you're making discoveries every day and training that next generation of Jamie's to go out and say there's something there, there's something here worth preserving, and let's get to work. So thank you very much for being on the Zeppos Report. Always a pleasure.